Hello and welcome to Folklore of the Universe, the podcast that puts the cool in folklore. Sort of. I'm your host, Kyle. This is episode 26. This is just going to be a fairly normal episode, but next week on the 21st, I'm going to be releasing our winter special, because that's when winter solstice is. So a bit close together, so this episode will be a little bit shorter, so I've got time to do all that, make that all acceptable, decent, meeting the bare minimum requirements, maybe? Something like that. But for now, we've got this episode, so we're going to do a Congolese folk story in this one. But first, as always, of course, we've got our Monster of the Week. This episode, the Monster of the Week, comes from Korean mythology. This one is called the Bolge. The Bolge are everyone's favorite mythology creature. They're demon dogs. We all like demon dogs, right? Maybe? Just me? Anyway, these particular ones are these fiery dogs from the Kingdom of Darkness who chase the sun and the moon across the sky. And when they catch them and bite them, that's what causes eclipses. The basic myth behind them is that the King of Darkness got sick of living in the dark, which, sort of weird weird flex, but okay, sort of his deal. But he sent his, uh, his dogs, his bolge, after the sun and the moon to go bring their light back. But when one um, bit the sun, it burned its mouth and it ran back. When one bit the moon, it was too cold, so it froze its mouth, so it ran back. And he keeps sending them back and forth to try and catch them. And every time they catch and bite them, that's what causes an eclipse. So when they bite the sun, that's a solar eclipse. When they bite the moon, that's a lunar eclipse. This idea of hellish fiery dogs isn't unique to here either. You might have heard of hellhounds before, which are other fiery dogs from Greek mythology. And those sort of spread around Europe too. So we had other fiery dogs and the black dog in England is a classic one. The Grim. This one's also kind of similar to uh, the giant wolf Skoal from Norse mythology, who's always chasing after the sun goddess and is going to eat her at Ragnarok. The same idea of giant death doom dogs chasing after the sun. I wonder why people like like these like deathly dog myths. Maybe because uh, dogs are like our bros, so it's sort of a perversion of that, where it's like, oh, what if, what if dogs were dicks? I mean, some dogs are dicks. There's a lot of bad dogs out there, but there's a lot of good dogs too. I think there's more good dogs than there are bad dogs, so it does sort of cancel out in the end. Every dog can be a good go- Every dog has a good dog in its heart. It just needs to let it out and breathe. Maybe not. Some are just rat bastards, I think. There's also, in South Korea, a very old, almost extinct dog breed called the Bolge, which is a reference to the mythological ones. And this breed has sort of reddish maroon coats, and they don't look very evil. They look pretty, pretty cute and friendly, because I guess they're actual dogs, you know, as opposed to the demonic ones. But they almost went extinct in the 90s, this uh, specific dog breed. In 2012, they were saved from uh, Dongyang University, who um, researched and rebred the last 20 ones and kept them alive. They're still around today, which is pretty cool. So save your dogs, people, because they're, they're, they're buddies, unless they aren't. You can say that about pretty much anything, though, to be fair. So let's just move on to our story now. So like I said earlier, this is a Congolese story from the Congo River area in Africa. And this story is called The Turtle and the Man. A turtle and a man built themselves a small town, but because they had as yet planted nothing, they suffered from hunger. Let us build a large trap, said the turtle, that we may catch an antelope. The man agreed, and they set to work and made a very large one. This is too large, said the turtle. Let us divide it, and each have a trap of his own. The man divided it, and the turtle chose the best one. That night, the man caught nothing, but a splendid antelope was found in the turtle's trap. As the turtle could not lift it, he called all the people from round about to a dance. While they were dancing, the chimpakasi, or wild ox, came out of the wood and wanted to know what all this singing was about. The turtle told him he had caught an antelope, and, as he could not carry it to his house, he had called in his friends. Perhaps, good ox, you will take the antelope out of the trap for me and lift it as far as my house. Oh, certainly, said the ox. And now, please go and fetch some water. The ox went and drew some water. Then they cut up the antelope. Clean the plates, please, said the turtle. And the delighted ox washed them. This is your share, dear ox. We must go and get some leaves to wrap it in. 
And while the ox was away in the woods collecting leaves, the turtle lifted all the meat up and carried it into his house, which was a very strong one, and shut himself inside. The ox returned and asked for his share, but the turtle refused to let him have it and insulted him grossly. The ox became very angry and told the turtle that he would destroy the trap. The turtle had reset the trap, so that when the ox put his head in, he was caught and died after a short struggle. Oh, oh, Mr. Ox, I told you so. You should be more careful when you're entering the turtle's trap. He called the people again to dance and sing. This time, the leopard was attracted by the noise and came to the turtle to find out what it was all about. And the turtle told him and said that his hands were very sore. They could not carry the ox to his house. Would the leopard drag him there? Glad to oblige the turtle, the leopard at once offered his services and in a very short time, had brought the ox to the turtle's house. Thank you, dear leopard. Will you now go to the river and fetch some water and clean the pots? Certainly, said the leopard. And when they had cooked the whole of the ox, the turtle put aside part of the meat for the leopard and carried the rest into his shin back. You would better go and fetch some leaves to wrap the meat in, said the turtle. The leopard went. While he was away, the turtle took the meat and shut himself within his strong house. The leopard returned and said, Turtle, turtle, where is my meat? It is here, my dear leopard. Then give it to me. Nay, the ox was mine. Yes, but I helped you to cook it. Well, I shall not give you any. Then I will destroy your trap. Take care you do not meet the fate of the ox. Yes, I will take care. And the leopard went and destroyed the trap entirely, and then, placing the rope around his neck, lay down in the middle of the ruins as if he had been entrapped. Then the turtle went again to look at his trap, and was delighted to find the leopard there. Ah, ah, I told you so. Why did you not take more care, my dear leopard? And the turtle stretched out his long neck as if to kiss the leopard. The leopard sprang upon him and bit the turtle's head off before he had time to pull it in. He then entered his gym back and ate up all the meat that the turtle had stored there. Now the man wondered what the leopard was doing in the turtle's shin back, so he went there and asked the leopard. The leopard told him how the turtle had tried to trick him, and how he had killed the turtle. And the man said he was quite right, and might go on eating the food of the turtle. The End So once again, as always, we've got an evil fucking turtle. Every time, every time, I swear to god, a turtle is in a story, it's this sneaky, conniving, backstabbing little shit. Like, why does this happen? What do turtles do to make everyone not trust them? Maybe it's just biology. Like, maybe because they get, they're free to backstab other people because you just backstab them. But no one can backstab them back because they've got, they've got the shell, so they're, they're immune. So maybe the ability to act with impunity has just made them gone mad with power. I mean, it's happened with billionaires, so why not turtles too, right? Maybe? I don't know. Is saying this can get me turtled? If I mysteriously disappear... Then, then I got turtled, so just so you know, that's what happens. But back to folklore, if you remember, or if you listened to the show way back then, episode 2, our story was one with um, a foot race between like an elephant, a, uh, a tortoise, and a hare, I think. This was a Yoruba story, so it was a ways away from the Congo area, but there could have been ideas traveling back and forth. And the turtle is a sneaky little shit then too. Then I think we also had another race one from North America, Native Americans, where the turtle is also sneaky shit. He was racing with beavers. So I think this is just a universal concept that turtles cannot be trusted. I cannot stress this enough. Do not trust your turtles. As for the other characters, um, the other animals, the story does give some sense as to their characters, so to speak, in Congolese folk stories. Because often, like we've talked about before, animal characters have sort of consistent characters throughout these stories. Like, you know, in one culture, a coyote is always clever and tricky and smart, and other animals always do their same things. So in this one, for example, we've got the ox is sort of trusting and dumb, and I'm assuming he's like that in every one. And Turtle, of course, is tricky and sneaky in all these stories. And then the jaguar is more crafty and street smart. And then the human is there. He's in the title and like at the very beginning and the very end and that's it. So I don't know why that's really relevant. But he's there. He sort of participates. Pretty clear moral. Or maybe there's two morals here. 
Because obviously there's the what goes around comes around. Like if you're a jerk and killing your friends, then they're going to kill you back. Uh, but also, from the turtle's point of view, there's sort of a uh, quit while you're ahead moral. Like if he just shared his food with the jaguar, because he had plenty already, he would have been fine. He would have done great, but he had, he had to push a little too far. Had that a gambler's fallacy, got to keep his winning streak, and he got got. And you don't want to got, got, get, get, got. So don't don't go too far. I mean, don't kill your friends at all, but if you're doing nice, unhorrible stuff, also quit while you're ahead. Basically, don't go to the casino with turtles because either they lose you all your money or they backstab you and steal all your money. Either way, you're SOL. Okay, I also just realized that I've been calling him Jaguar in this bit. It is a leopard. Leopards, they live in Africa. Jaguars live in South America. So that's my bad. My B. So yeah, leopard, not Jaguar. Leopard. Just to eliminate any confusion you might had. Uh, anyway, I do also like how the turtle's house was really strong and tough. Sort of like a turtle shell type deal. Which I thought was a really funny thing to put in. So he's got his shell, then his house, which is like a second shell. Both are strong. So he's got, like, the Fort Knox of meat over there. That's about all I've got for this story, though. But I realize that this has gone a bit faster than I thought it would. Uh, we're still only at, what, 11 minutes? So I think I'll do one more short, quick story, and then call the episode there. So you all can get a little bonus round, bonus story, just sweeten the pot a bit for this episode. Make it a bit longer, pat it out. And let's just go with another Congolese one, because might as well. And uh, here's a story. This one is called, Why the Crocodile Does Not Eat the Hen. There was a certain hen, and she used to go down to the river's edge daily to pick up bits of food. One day, a crocodile came near to her and threatened to eat her, and she cried, Oh, brother, don't! And the crocodile was so surprised and troubled by this cry that he went away, thinking how he could be her brother. He returned again to the river another day, fully determined to make a meal of the hen. But she again cried out, Oh, brother, don't! Bother the hen! The crocodile growled as she once more turned away. How can I be her brother? She lives in a town on land. I live in mine in the water. Then the crocodile determined to see in zombie about the question and get her to settle it. So he went his way. He had not gone very far when he met his friend Mbambi, a very large kind of lizard. Oh Mbambi, he said, I am sorely troubled. A nice fat hen comes daily to the river to feed, and each day, as I'm about to catch her, take her to my home and feed on her, she startles me by calling me brother. I cannot stand it any longer, and I'm now often zombie to hold a palaver about it. Silly idiot, said the Mbambi. Do nothing of the sort, or you will only lose the palaver and show your ignorance. Don't you know, dear crocodile, that the duck lives in the water and lays eggs? The turtle does the same, and I also lay eggs. The hen does the same, and so do you, my silly friend. Therefore, we are all brothers, in a sense. And for this reason, the crocodile now does not eat the hen. The End Surprisingly, this story actually ends up being pretty wholesome. Like, you think it's going to be all about stuff eating other stuff, but then it's like, you know, we're all brothers, all gotta live together. Uh, well, it's only for the egg-laying gang, though, so really, we're not included in that whole thing. But still nice to see from over the fence, over the garden wall, to all of them getting along. Although, I'm sure crocodiles eat egg-laying stuff, right? Like, don't they eat fish sometimes, or birds, maybe, if they could get one? I don't know. I don't actually know about crocodile eating habits too much, so maybe they don't. Maybe they eat nothing that lays eggs. It's only mammals, and yeah, that's it, really, isn't it? No bugs, even. Wow. Well, I'm sure you can tell by now that this is another um, explanation story for why something happens or doesn't happen. It's literally in the goddamn title, so it should be pretty pretty clear there. Just a couple of word things to clear up. Um... Palaver is just a uh, slang term for an informal meeting, so it's a meetup, it's a discussion, talk, talkaroo type deal. Then they also mention Nzambi, and Nzambi is a Congolese high creator god. So basically, um, the crocodile goes out to meet God and find out why this hen is saying this crazy stuff. 
So overall, pretty wholesome story. Never really thought crocodiles could be super wholesome, uh, because they're a little scary primeval. Um, Those are mostly saltwater crocodiles, I think. Those are the really nasty ones, vicious ones. Although I think Nile crocodiles aren't very good either. So whatever these crocodiles are, they're pretty wholesome. Most wholesome reptile right there. But I'm afraid that is now all the time I've got for this episode, so I'm going to wrap it up here. So once again, as always, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, As usual, all the sharing around stuff. Uh, We're going to have another episode next week on the 21st. That's going to be our winter special. And then I'm going to be going back home for winter. And there will be no new episodes until January. Either first, second, or third week of January. Depending on how hectic things are when I get back. So that is all that. Uh, So I'll see you next week for an extra special special. And I've been Kyle. This has been the show. And goodbye.